welcome to uh, a new edition of Take Fountain. I'm really excited about this one for a lot of reasons. But the man you're, we're going to spend this time with uh, is someone uh, I would not have had the career that I had were it not for David Hartman. Um, we traveled the world together. We, uh, and I mean really, you know, we were in nuclear submarines under the Pacific Ocean. We were uh, with the Army and the Czech border and the, during the Cold War and in Europe. We were at uh, uh, we were in Africa, we were uh, in uh, Honduras, we were all over everywhere and did everything. And I realized as, um, as this show is about the origins of things, we did the origins of um, Richard Pryor's movie career, we did the origins of uh, The View, the, uh, uh, lots, of, lots of different things that we've been all over in this uh, uh, Smoking the Bandit we did. Um, I traveled everywhere with David Hartman and I never asked him any of the questions we're about to ask today. And it's, it's funny how you can do that. You can, you can be with someone, don't you think? I, it's I, I don't know why that is. I don't know why. So, it, so it's extremely exciting for me to say, here is all the stuff I never asked you when we were sitting on planes and in military transports and going to Greenland and all those other things. I never asked you any of these questions. Thank you, David, for being with us. My pleasure, Bill. It's great to see you again. And Tom, it's nice meeting you. Yeah, well, it, it is a huge honor to have you on the show. For for those who don't don't know, David is the the first host of Good Morning America. So the show was sort of built around him, and I don't I know he probably said no, it was a team effort. And blah, blah. yeah, okay, fine. But but it was basically built around David, and it was it was built out from there. So we knew we, they wanted David. Here's what here's what I, I I here are all the questions I never asked him. What did you? What was your last job before Good Morning America? Do you remember what you did? Were you still an actor? Were you? What, what did you do exactly? The last um, job was I produced and wrote my first documentary. Okay. I created a documentary company uh, at the request of ABC, as a matter of fact, and produced that documentary. And that, uh, we'll get to it later, but that's what led that's to That's what this. led to this. Because, see, in my mind, they went, oh, there's this actor, David Hartman, which I guess is not the case, but, they, but you were, had an extremely successful acting career. You made The, uh, the Bold Ones and uh, yeah. Lucas Tanner. Right. And, and, and you were a big, I think, really was an NBC star, weren't you? I mean, it would have been an NBC show, right? Probably. So, so, it, so at what point did they go... Hey, this guy should be doing this show. We have this idea for a show. Let me actually let me back it up. Let me back it up even more, and then I'll stop talking. In these days, ABC was not just the third network. It, it, there were really two networks, and then there was ABC. And ABC did not have a morning show pre presence. And when you don't have a morning show presence in those days, believe it or not, boys and girls, if you when you turned on your television in the morning, it stayed there a lot of the day. So the Today Show was very much responsible for a lot of hits on NBC that night because to, to, the Today Show had, was, had been around for two or three generations by that time. What, when did the Today Show start? The 50s or something? 1952. 52. So, so, so taking on the Today Show was really, in many people's mind, a fool's errand. It was a staple of television, it was never going to change. It was always going to be there, and, and GMA was always going to be an also ran. What what was the first time that you heard the the idea that they wanted you to do this show? Can you go right back in time with this? If I may, you touched on two or three of the key basics that go back to how it all began. Right. But let me go back to one of your first questions. Um, what I was doing before. You mentioned the Bold Ones medical program off scene. I mean, ABC had learned about my background, which was economics. It was foreign policy. It was active duty Air Force. During right. the Cold War. They knew about a lot of my background that was not obvious to most people. But during the Bold Ones, I started researching medicine by going around the country looking for stories that might be not only dramatic uh, for the bold ones, but also accurate and that people could tie into to learn about how to get better medical care. My idea was during those years that um, we have a responsibility to try to present information to people 
that they can use in a constructive way in their lives. And, and I lectured about what I thought was a symbiotic relationship between the medical community and television and spoke around the country and Ted Kennedy, Senator Kennedy asked me to come speak before a subcommittee, which I did about this very subject. So that's what I was so, involved So they didn't just see you as this actor from the Baldwin's. You had had, they, they, saw, they saw the whole person that you were. And when I say they saw, who am I talking about? Who, who, are, the, who are the people that are approaching you? Okay, well, who approached me? Was it was it Goldenson back then? Was it was it? I mean, who would who would have well, been? It was yeah, it was Bob Shanks, but it Bob was, Shanks. It was, it was Leonard, yes. Goldenson, yes. he was the boss man. Yeah. But let me get back to that in a minute, and back to how ABC knew about me. They knew that I'd done all this research for the NBC program. They said, "Would you like to produce some specials about medicine for us at ABC?" And I said, yes, I would like to consider it. And they said, well, what do you have in mind for maybe a first program? And I said, well, what comes to mind immediately is I want to do it on prenatal care. Now, you could have heard a pin drop at the <laughs> other end of the phone when I said uh, prenatal care. Sure. And I said, what? <laughs> and I great. said, well, it happens to be very important because it helps assure that babies can be born healthy in our country. And we can tell this story and maybe save some children's lives. And they said, oh, and it was still quiet on the other end of the phone. And I said, oh, by the way, in the process, I want for us to show the birth of a child for the first time on American television, because we see death and destruction every day and violence on television why not show the beginning of a healthy life? And ABC responded to that. Long story short, we produced the program, showed the birth of a child for the first time, talked about prenatal care, and that's what led to, a year later, Bob Shanks and Mr. Golins and so on, come to me and saying, would you be interested in, in, um, in hosting our new morning program? Now, on that regard, alluding to what you just said, that television was actually going back a bit, was created or invented back in the 1920s. No. But World War II stopped the commercialization, but it was after the war in the early 50s that television burst into our homes. A burst is a little overstatement because there were, as you said, only two networks. Right. And that was it. There was nothing else, not like today, with hundreds of channels and social sure. media and so forth. So it was those two zones. That's when Leonard Goldenson, who was a super smart executive in entertainment, said we need a third network. And he created what we know as the American Broadcasting Company, ABC. And to compete with the other networks, NBC and, and uh, CBS, he started with primetime entertainment. He went from there to sports and news. He went to late night. He went to daytime. So he was filling all the slots to compete except early morning. And now we're up to 1974 and five years later, ABC knew that they had to get a morning show on because the stations were demanding it. Right. So I got a phone call on the 3rd of October. It was a significant day in my career in life. The call, would you come over to the office on 6th Avenue and, and, and talk about it? And he said, would you like to host our new morning program, uh, Good Morning America? We talked about it. We agreed about what the program should be. And it was that it didn't it wasn't complicated. OK, but but you said you agreed about what the program should be. There must have been some discussion that the Today Show was a certain thing and you couldn't be that, right? I mean, there had, there had to be some discussion about philosophy. There was, correct. And we, we doubted that we could take audience away from the Today Show. It had been doing the same program pretty consistently and they, they needed a little shake up over there too. We said, now no, but 
as far as we were concerned, Bob Shank said, what, what, how do you see this program? And I said, I think our goal is to present information to people that they can use a constructive way in their personal lives. That is our goal, it's our mission. We want to get information to people that they can use positively somehow in their lives. And that involves, um, you know, government, um, uh, foreign affairs, politics, medicine, law, education, science, you name it. But our goal was to sit and have quiet conversations with people. And in our studio, you could hear a pin drop. We thought our guests deserve to have quiet conversations and be able to actually think and talk in conversation and not be overridden every two seconds because we're not having a conversation because people want to have a fight. We did the opposite of that. And so that was our goal. And my image in my own head looking into a camera was I'm having a quiet and again, I keep repeating the word because it was important. Right. A quiet conversation with one person or with one or two people sitting in the studio. We never told people what to think. We never, we never um, in any way expressed our own opinions. We decided that ahead of time. Now I'm getting to the ways that we were different from right, today. Right, right. But that was our goal to bring information to people that they could use in their lives. And that's what we tried to do every single day. And it worked. Uh, but but I, I can remember as I was a cameraman in uh, Oklahoma City at KOCO TV, which is an ABC affiliate in Oklahoma City. And I remember watching Good Morning America. So my perspective from the beginning was that, and you may not like this, but the GMA was a lighter show. It was a more lighthearted show. Not, not, not that you didn't do serious things, but it wasn't it didn't have a toughness to it and the second thing that i that i thought and i thought was the most important thing of all that i always thought the today show opened the doors on new york and the gma opened the doors on america and i think that that was a huge huge difference don't you think uh it, absolutely and regarding what you just said about hard versus soft one of the things when we started with shanks that before we did it he said, do you have any requests about how we set up the studio? And I said, well, you're professionals at that. That's not what I do. But since mm -hmm. you asked, right. I said, I will not sit at a news desk. Sure. Because, you know, it's I'm a professional and I'm telling you what to think. And I'm behind the desk and that whole image. And I said, that's not part of quietly having a conversation and presenting information to people in conversation. And so uh, that was the appearance of lightness, but it was anything but. No, I realize that. And, and you asked and you... a lot of people who were guests on the program, national, international sure. leaders. I, I'm not gonna quote them, but I could quote a lot of them who said that we were not only fair, we, we were tough, but we were fair. Right. In other words, we didn't blurt out, I'm gonna get you. Sure. We didn't do get you. Right. No, and I we never did. No, and, and but but you're right. The sort of the trappings of it were there was a nice couch, there was this lovely bah, 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 music that kind of you know that that sort of set that I can't remember who somebody famous did it. Was it Manilow or somebody who wrote who wrote that that theme? It was, it was um, some it was uh, some famous person wrote the GMA theme. Well, no, I, he, I forgot. He, he wrote a lot of Broadway shows. Yeah, he, um, I'm just blanking out right now. Yeah, but but anyway, but point is that when you saw the show, it felt. Uh, like a safer place. I don't know. That's just what it said. It felt like a safer place to have your conversation. And obviously that worked. Now, I'm going to take you all the way back. First day. Do you remember the first day of Good Morning America, the launch of the show? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and importantly, that was only four weeks to the day after Bob Shanks asked if I wanted to do it. We were on the air in four weeks. Wow. wow. And... <laughs> And so, and I even said to Fred Silverman, because Fred was a master at promotion, among other things, programming and so on. But I said to Fred before he went on the air, um, 
I said, you'll be criticized for hiring me. That's another story. But I said, we don't, please don't over promote us at the beginning. Give us time to try to work the show out and figure out what it's going to be. And you, you can't just write it on paper and have it happen. And I said, so the fact is that first day, we won't know what we're doing. And Fred kind of, <laughs> he grabbed his neck and said, oh, don't tell me not to promote. <laughs> I said, well, I'm asking you not to promote. You're right. Um, because we're going to have to take time to figure out what our programming is and what works and what does not. So yeah. that's what the first day was like. And we just said, we'll go one day at a time. Uh, I've got a new craft and art to learn. I will learn it. I will work harder than anybody uh, to make that happen. And I had great teachers, our writers, our staff, Steve Bell and News. Sure, and Steve's they were great. All, they were all great friends and teachers of mine to whom I'm eternally grateful. Um, the uh, did, did, Do you remember the moment when you thought this is going to work? I mean, because, you know, because here, here, let me, let me, let me back things up a little bit further. This is another one of these shows that people said it'll never work. And I, having, having launched The View, I'm, I've been a part of that. I've been a part of uh, Rune Arledge saying this is a terrible idea. It, uh, nobody wants that time slot. This will never be successful. News to, now, and then, then after, once you launch it, after a few years, all news can think of is getting their hands on it. And I think GMA was the first example of that. Am I right? Well, when we started, um, just so you know, that first day and those first months, we had about 100 stations tuned in, affiliates. The ABC stations were begging ABC. That's why they were going so fast to do a morning show. They needed a morning show to lead off their days. Yeah. Um, when we started that first day, weeks, months, we had uh, around 100 stations. Um, we had zero com paid commercials. And there were so few viewers that they did not show up in the ratings. Amazing. That was our beginning. Uh, and, that, that's and a soft launch, said, as they say. That would be a soft launch. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So... But to answer your question, when did, quote, I know or we know, that took months and months, and we literally went day by day and said, did we do a better job today than we did yesterday? We did not expect immediate results to show up. We also did not expect to take viewers away from today. We looked to create a new morning audience, and I am told that that's eventually what happened. But the fact is, it took two and a half to three years. We became number one doing the program that we wanted to do. We had all paid up commercials. We had more than 200 stations, uh, 220 stations. And we made, uh, by adding GMA to the program schedule, ABC for the first time became a quote, full service network. And that is to get Leonard Goldenson's smartness knew that it would take time to happen. And he and he 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 put his money where his mouth was and stuck with it yeah. and didn't turn around the way so many programs do, as you know, and Tom, God knows, you know, that it, they say this in August, this is the greatest show from top liver and it's going to be gone by the end of Thanksgiving. Right. And so that's why we said don't promote us too much but we want people to know we're there so we just got up every day and did the best we could and tried to make the show better one day at a time so bill i in thinking about this opportunity to talk to mr hartman today i was reminded that my parents who were huge devotees of murrow and cronkite and glued to cbs as a result for ever yeah there was a moment when i went home somewhere in uh, 76 and my mother came into the room and turned on David's show. Right. And I said, what's this? 
And she said, oh, this is the best morning show. This is yeah. the one. Yeah. And my dad came through, what's going on, he said to her. Mm. And she said a few things, whatever you were talking about. There's this, there's that. And he got in the car and went to, the, went to his office. So when that kind of thing happens, you know something amazing is going on inside the creative process. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's really interesting to hear you say that. And that was pretty early. I didn't think we were that hot a number just, just a year in, but we were working on it. <laughs> well, yeah. You, you know what ha happened is, uh, and I, I, again, I go back to being this kid starting his career at, at an ABC affiliate in Oklahoma City, is that they, when the affiliates do their big promotion. And if you remember the still the one, remember the still the one promotion that they would do, we're still the one. Like ABC was, had become number one for the first time ever. The, the ABC as a network became number one. I mean, it, you know, it would have been around for what, 20 years, 20, 30 years or something like that. It became number one for the first time ever. And I think that a lot of that was laid uh, at the feet of happy days, work and Mindy, Laverne and Shirley, uh, a, a lot of shows that were big back then, and rightly so, but it didn't become number one until there was a solid morning show in place. Well, that's what I mentioned about the term full service network. Right. Um, that had completed the day schedule leading into the rest of the day. You alluded to that in your opening remarks. And, uh, and, and ABC needed it. Leonard understood it and made it happen. And uh, we were, I was just privileged to be a small part of it. Uh, it's a privilege to do that kind of work. If you think and hope that you're presenting information to people that they can walk away from the set and feel they've won either learn something or they've learned something that they can put to work in their lives. Right. And to the extent we did that, that's why I say doing that work is a privilege. You know, I have, um, I have, um, I, I was a field producer at Good Morning America. So the stuff that Dave was talking about was all done. A lot of it was done in studio. But the, we had this amazing field unit, and we did a lot of interesting things. Uh, uh, needless to say, I mean, David and I, how, how many places? In, in Northern Ireland, uh, Africa, uh, I don't know. I, I can't I, I, I go on and on. I have a, I have a bunch of photographs, we, and, I, I will, and we'll put them up in post, but basically uh, that, that are funny to me. Uh, are not funny or interesting to me. Uh, the, the one of them, there are two things that we won Emmys for together, David and I. Right. We won Emmys for uh, something on called uh, the B1 bomber, um, and and I would love you to tell that story if you wouldn't mind. Why that was such a big event? Why, why we, uh, why people, why it. <laughs> I actually am kind of emotional about it. Uh, why that was so important for you personally. When you said we won new, uh, Emmys together, two yeah, of them. Yeah. What was important here was they were national news and documentary Emmys. That's exactly right. Yeah. They were not Emmys entertainment. They were not daytime Emmys. Emmys. They were that not entertainment division. The fact that we were trying to teach history. That's exactly you right. Know, you know, David McCullough, the great Pulitzer writer and was asked about, you know, how do you teach history? And he asked Barbara Tuckman, who's one of the great historians. Yeah. And he asked Barbara, you know, how do you um, teach history? And she said, it's simple, tell stories. Right, yeah. So let's go to the B-1 bomber. I was Air Force, I had an Air Force background, but for many years we kept hearing and continue to hear how much money do we spend on national defense? Big question. And I said, I don't think anybody deals with that a lot, but it comes to, let's say, a weapons system. Now that's a, you know, a term they use in the military. And at the moment, Jimmy Carter had canceled the B-1 bomber when he was elected president in 76. But then Ronald Reagan resurrected the B-1 bomber. And I thought, and this is where the idea came from, I said, let's do an entire program. Imagine this today in morning television. <laughs> <laughs> let's do an entire program exploring the complexity between Congress, industry, the Pentagon, and national leadership in creating, quote, a weapons system. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
and we outlined and wrote an entire program about it. And the first step was to go to Edwards Air Force Base and fly in the B-1 bomber. You produced it, you were there. That was this first experience in that regard that you and I had. That's exactly right, yes. Now, it was a three and a half hour test mission. Uh, I was up, you had two chase planes. We were shooting from all angles. We were going Mach one and a half and blah, 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 blah. So we did that whole story. 28 days later, that airplane with two of the three crewmen who flew me that day crashed at Edwards and the chief Rockwell test pilot, Doug Benefield, was killed. It was a huge event. Our producer came to me and said, in, in the office that day yeah. and we had yeah. just learned that Doug had been killed and she said we now can't do the entire program would you write the piece to you know for whatever you want to write about it and I sat down and wrote it and you went right to the editing room and edited it right where we where we where we honored and commemorated all test pilots for what they do as public servants um, for the country with their dedication. Now, there was the story, but the point, one of them is that the idea was to present a piece of history, explain it, and why is it important in people's lives every day, and would they learn more about this business of national defense because we did a two-hour program about it. Right. So we were ambitious about that stuff, and that's what I went back to at, at the beginning of trying to include history, teach history, and and give people some real information that they come away from the television set and they, they learn something they didn't know. I remember and that. They, yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember that so clearly because I was I was, you know, maybe thirty and I had never had anything that I thought was that important in my life thrust into my hands. And so what happened was you had to do the show the next morning and I started editing it, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night or something, something like that, whatever it was. And we even had the discussion, did we, because the, the piece wasn't about Doug Benefield. So it was, there were many other people we talked to and pilots and, 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 and ground crew and every, you know, uh, generals and so on. And, and we, you said, do you think we have enough? Of Doug and I said I don't know I know we have him inspecting the plane beforehand and so we we cobbled together a completely different story than what we had planned to do and and I remember cutting it I remember all this stuff and I remember showing you that morning and you said everything on this is perfect except that plane is not a whatever the heck it was it's a such as you knew the planes and I didn't uh, and that's your and uh, it's all I'll hear is that we called that plane the wrong thing and I rushed back do you remember any of this I rushed back I and took out the wrong plane and put in the right plane <laughs> and then we put it on the air and it was um, and and you I I believe stayed very close with that family for a long time um, uh, very yeah very very close with his, with his wife yeah yeah, the answer to that is yes. I won't go into detail. Yeah, of course. That. Well, I mean, it's it's uh, it, it, and and then the second thing. I mean, I I, 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 I David and I went to to Africa together, and it, so it's, that's an, it's an amazing thing, no matter what, when you go when you go take a trip like that. But I, there are pictures in my mind, and I have to get I gather them together for this broadcast of us with the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, and how. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is, uh, in those days, they, they were killing these, you know, there were poachers and so on. And it was all that Diane Fossey stuff, gorillas in the mist, whatever. This is right after that. Right. And, uh, and David and I <laughs> traipse up the, the mountain with these guides. And one, it just doesn't feel safe. It just, you know, it just doesn't feel safe, right? It doesn't feel like we should be here at all. Like it's, you know, we're, we're, drive, we're driving into, I don't know how much reminiscing we want to do here, but we're driving in across these, this dirt road and everybody's in the field and they had like, remember they had bananas on their heads and things like that. And everybody stops, puts down whatever they're doing and looks at us. And I said to the driver, like, they've just never seen a white man before. And he says, no, they've never seen a car before. Wow. And I thought, no. oh, he says, cars are so rare that people will stop for miles around and watch them go by. 
I thought, man, we are at the end of the earth here. And then we, <laughs> and, then, and then we walk up this mountain and it's supposed, we're supposed to find, they're supposed to know where the gorillas are because they tracked them yesterday with another group of saps that went up the mountain to find the gorillas. Right. And, and so we're walking and it's like, you're walking on top of the jungle. It's like they're hacking things down so you That's can, right. and, and after a few hours, you know, when we're lugging equipment here, sure. you know, I mean, it's, the equipment's heavy in those days. It's not like it is now. Now you'd probably just take your iPhone. But and, uh, in those days, it was a lot. And, you know, I, David's got, got equipment. I've got equipment. Well, we're, and we're looking at each other like, this is a bust, right? Like, this is taking forever for this thing to happen. And then you remember that moment when we see them? Do you remember that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, we just sort of pushed back a little vegetation, and it was like a family is just frolicking in front of us like a few feet away with the babies and the teenagers wow. and mom and dad and the silverback sitting there taking it all in. I mean, huh. you, you the, talk about something you don't forget. Yes. Well, you know, the, the, you mentioned those moments. I remember when we were saying, you know, we have to keep walking at 95 to humid degrees yes. at 8,000 feet. Yeah. Right. And I said to the guide, I remember saying, what, what do we do if we're charged? Yes. And he said, just lie, just lie down, <laughs> and, and, you know, and then that's when I wrote the line, which I gave to you that you included. Yes. The line was, in other words, don't do any anything you would do when you're charged by a raging gorilla. <laughs> yeah, don't do any of the things you would normally do. That's exactly right. That's right. In let, fact, me, let, me, let me back up. Yeah. When get to Africa, you yeah. were there a week earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the re this goes back to the show being soft. The United States bombed Libya in 1986 trying to kill Gaddafi. Uh, they missed. He, he lived. Yeah. And he disappeared uh, from public view for five to six months. And every news organization in the world had, um, had put in requests to interview Gaddafi when he decided he wanted to reemerge in public. And one day, in fact, I was down in Texas doing a show with Chuck Yerger. That's a whole other story. But I got a call from the producer, our producer, who said, um, are you sitting down? And I said, well, I will, because you're about to tell me something. Mm -hmm. And she said, right. She said, um, Monday night, you're going to Libya to interview Muammar Gaddafi. So I flew to Libya, went out on the desert one night, at midnight, whatever, did a 55 minute interview, flew out of Libya, went to Germany, did the show live from there. You think about the capability of communications that we could do this. Yes. So, right. Yeah. And I did the show the next day. We did the entire two hour program about Muammar Gaddafi. Why was he important? What had he done? What had he not done? We had the State Department. We had the CIA. We had that was how we told long, broad, serious, important stories. And Gaddafi was just a part of it. Right. So you were already in Africa. From Germany, I got in the plane, flew to Nairobi, got in a Cessna, and came out to join you out in the prairie land, or whatever it's called, in Africa. And a pilot looked down and said, we can't land on a dirt strip. And I said, why not? He said, well, just look. How many lions are, th are there on the, on the strip? Yeah, right. So, but that's when I joined you there in Africa. I remember when we were at Kilimanjaro with all the elephants. Right. And we were like, now this is where producers try to have their way with people on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously I've never forgotten that. <laughs> so we're leaving in our, you and I and a couple of others for the crew, and we're on a little dirt road and we come around a corner to, we're leaving Kilimanjaro after two days there and there standing right in the middle of the road is a big bull elephant. And Bill, you looked at me and said, and you stopped the car and said, listen, 
get out. He said, this is a great promo to do. Now, promos were things we did, you know, that were like eight, ten seconds. Yeah. And the program would say, when we come back, we're going to talk with the whole elephant or whatever, right? He said, get out, stand there in the middle of the road. And I said, you get out. And you stand in the middle of the road. Yeah, because elephants are ornery. Camera, I can shoot too. Yeah. So I got out. Well, anyway, it was just a funny memory. I did the promo, and then we jumped back in the car, and the bull elephant did not rush me. Yeah. But I've never forgot that you tried to kill me. Well, I. <laughs> well, and it's true about. El I mean, it's funny when people ask me that. It, it must be how amazing how uh, human like the apes are and all this stuff. I say, yeah, but honestly, I think the elephants are the most like humans. They're fantastic. They're incredible. Just, they're incredibly intelligent. They're very protective. They're keeping a lookout for everything. That and they and they're and they're mean if you try to get too close to them or their child. Uh, just like we are. Just like we are. They're the most <laughs> like humans, I thought, uh, of all the animals that I saw. It was fantastic. Yeah, it, it, it was. Really it was amazing. Let me give. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reminisce, reminisce a little bit more. I also have distinct memories of. I'm sorry. Did you have something you want to ask? No, no, no. I go keep going because I have something I want to say, but I want to hear this next. Okay, piece. fine. I'm sorry. I, this is, I just know David so well. I no, never no, get a no, chance to great. talk to I him. I love it. Um, and. I also have this distinct memories, uh, David, because people in the military knew that David knew what he was talking about when it came to that sort of stuff, as he has sort of outlined now, we had access to do a special on the military, how we spent our money and whether we were getting our bang for the buck and so on. And we did things that you will never see again. I mean, I'm telling you, we, we, they staged a, a, a strategic air command um, alert at in Spokane, I can't remember the name of the, the, the Air Force Base or whatever that was, just for our cameras. They took us in, under the Pacific Ocean in a nuclear submarine. They, we went with the Army to Honduras. We uh, stood on the Czech border and st when it was still the Cold War and we would stare at a guy who's about as far away as you are. Right. And, right. He's, and he's, you know, and, and we just look at each other and, and that's all you do because there was a line in the sand there. We did these amazing things. But the thing that stands out in my mind, and I don't know about you, David, was that we spent the night on board two different vessels. And one of them was the USS uh, New Jersey, a battleship. And you got to see what it was like to be a sailor in World War II. And it wasn't fun. Right. It, it, first of all, the, they were cots in the middle of hallways, basically. That's what it, we were on this cot in the middle of the hallway. And when we stood on the deck, they, and they fired the big guns on the battleship, you thought something had gone wrong. At least I did. I thought, oh no, we're all dead. The, something exploded, something went wrong. In fact, that's exactly what it feels like to be on a battleship when one of those big guns go off. Did you feel that way too? Oh, sure. And there's 16 inch guns, they can shoot a bullet the size of a Volkswagen 35, 40 miles accurately. Yeah. But yeah, and I was out on the deck. You were up on the bridge, as I recall. Yes. The camp. But when those guns went off, <laughs> it's not like a firecracker going no. off. No. The whole ship rocks. Yeah. yeah in fact, so it messed up the cameras. The, it yeah. messed up the cameras because the cameras yeah. go like this because whatever that concussion is, uh, it, 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 but anyway, the, the second memory that comes to my mind was, and I think that this was the, the, the Air Force, I mean, or the Navy having fun with us, is we spent the night on the Carl Vinson. Do you remember this? Well, the, and, they, well. and they put us, there were night ops, so planes are taking off and landing. They put us on whatever the level was right below that, whatever the runway is. Flight deck. Flight deck. Flight deck. And, so, and, the, and the bunks are like this. Your nose is this far away from the next bunk. And they're landing all night long. And every time they land, you think you're going to die. You think something again has gone wrong. There's an explosion. You can, you can hear the, 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 the tail hook grab. You, the whole thing, it was just... Uh, I, I've never gotten so little sleep on a tour with, uh, 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 in television as that time. But these are amazing memories that I had with this man. I just wanted to, sh to share this. Well, you know, the thing about the aircraft carrier, you realize the way people talk about what happens on the deck of a carrier, it really is amazing. Yeah. 
And I remember the course because I got a backseat two and a half hour ride in the F-14 Tomcat, you know, from the carrier. That's right. And trapped again, trapped, land on the aircraft carrier. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, but you realize, and how those people on deck, most of them were 18, 19, 20 years old. And that's a dangerous place to be. And you realize how many young people have volunteered to help protect our country. Right. And, and I've been I've written what more than 30 hours of documentaries about veterans from World War Two on just to highlight the dedication of so many people who have worked and dedicate their lives to keeping our country free. And that's why I keep doing all those programs. I, I, th I think that, uh, that I wanted to bring all these things up, uh, partially because I think of this sort of stuff as, this is the sort of thing you wouldn't see on GMA today. I hate to be like, you know, I hate to be this way, but it is true. You're not gonna see, you, we, did, we did something with Ted Williams, the great Ted Williams, right? We went, we went down and we, this is one of the great experiences of my life. And we, we uh, went fly fishing or David went fly fishing. I sat there and said, put the camera over there and put the camera, you know, I did other. And Ted Williams was a cantankerous, funny man. And he took the piss out of me the entire day. Just the entire day said, are you all right, Bill? Cause you don't look like happy. You okay, can I get you something? You, you okay, fine, you're gonna be all right, good. And then they would throw the line in the water and you guys continue talking and says, he'd say, I think Bill's got a problem. You know, he's like, <laughs> and, uh, and, but those, those amazing conversations, and those were long pieces that ran in daytime. You know, they, they right. were, uh, the, those things just don't, they just don't happen anymore. Do you feel that? Or do you, or do you uh, I mean, it's just a different world. You know, it, there's nothing you can do, but um, you don't must feel that to a certain degree. Well, somebody told me that MTV started it, you know, how, you know, little short, fast things. But yeah, everything's a minute, two minutes. I remember after Charlie Gibson replaced me, I visited the show one day and he asked me about ratings. He said, what, uh, when you were on the show, you know, how, what were the rating blocks or whatever they're called? Tom knows more about this stuff than I do, I'm sure. Um, but I said, well, it's my recollection. I never got in detail with ratings every day. I had other things to do. But I said, my recollection is that they were in 15 minute blocks that they would say in this block, yeah, yeah. so many viewers in that block, so many viewers, 15 minutes. He said, now they're down to checking every one to two minutes. And, and that suggests what you're saying, that the need is to go so fast they're afraid to lose viewers in two minutes. I guess Tom could explain this better than I. <laughs> Let me let me interrupt here for just a sure. second. No, I'm sorry. I'm I've shut you out. This is this is no, only no. because I'm so excited to have no, David no, here that I, I haven't this. let Tom do what he normally no. does, which is join in the conversation. No, no, no. I apologize. No, Go ahead. Don't apologize for a second because this is the most fun I've had doing a podcast. Oh, thank and you. And here's why. <laughs> here's why. I have two incredibly smart, thoughtful, worldly guys who've been through all kinds of stuff in their lives, and they still have curiosity passion for life and a sense of wonder and those things are missing in the media world that I understand today and I'm really 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 Thank honored you. to be here with both of you guys you. and you talk to each other all you want I'll sit here for five hours and I, listen to this I don't have really much else to say except for this um, I attribute my interest in things it's it, 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 David's interest in the world was and is contagious so what happened for me, uh, we, we did something, this is gonna be very strange, but I happened to see the picture this morning because I was looking through my photographs of us together. There's a picture of us with a bunch of men working at a Dutch bell foundry. Me and David and the crew and a bunch of guys in big boots and some bells. A place where they smelt bells, I guess. And, and we, we had done something on technology and the use of computers in, in old technology and what have you was, and it was interesting. David did an interview with one of the guys and, I, and he went through a, a, a reel of tape, which I think in those times, days was like 30 minutes or something like that. He says, I'm gonna, I have a few more questions. And I remember going up to him and saying, I think we got it. 
you know, I think that it's, it's just making bells, David, you know, <laughs> where they're smelting bells. David's interest in it was genuine. Oh, yeah. And over the course of time being with David, I got more interested in things because he was interested. And I think that, you know, that, 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 that John Houston, that famous thing I'm always quoting when they ask John Houston what's the most important thing of life, life and he says interest. He didn't say, you know, uh, family and love and God, and I'm, which I assume should be on any list too, but he said interest. And uh, as I get older, when, he, when I think about that, I think of David. He is genuinely interested in the world around him, and it's contagious, and he brought that to daytime television, to morning television. Well, Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. And Tom, thank you for your comment. Uh, you used the word curious. Yes. And that is right at the basic of all of the. And when people are interviewers, like, you know, what we did or what uh, is done every day now, you can't fake curiosity. No, it's true. You either got it or you ain't. Yeah, yeah. And you can tell the difference when somebody really wants to know in a good, positive, constructive way, as opposed to, you know, I've got to ask this question yeah. because somebody wrote it for me. So, Tom, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. No, it's it's really great. Thank you. Very for, exciting. Thank you for being with us, David. Uh, uh, I guess that's it. That's our show for today. Remember, there are no shortcuts in show business. There are many, many detours. This is Bill Getty with Tom Mount advising you to take film. Thank you, David. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much.